would bring you only disappointment. It's always very dangerous to have such high praise being given to one when one can't actually, uh, one can't actually uh, justify it. But I would try my best how much it may fall from the standard. Professor Ajad Ahmed had come and addressed a meeting in this room. He had come to Aliyah. He also attended two sessions of the Indian History Congress. So that his interest in history was obvious. He presided over the section on history of countries other than India, if I remember right. Um, if I remember right, he also belonged to UP. I think we should be proud of, now that we have Yogi Arundhidhyanath and others also belonging to our province. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Ajaz Ahmed insisted on the uh, relevance of philosophy as inter interrelationship with other fields of study. And um, his interest in history means that he was also very greatly interested in the connections between philosophical ideas and history. As has been remarked about him, he was a strong supporter of Marxist theory, to which also he contributed. And um, this was a ground that I very humbly shared with him also because of my interest in history also had roots in Marxism. Um, I would like to say that uh, history and philosophy are uh, please shut up. Okay. History and philosophy are closely related. Because when you begin writing history, you have to establish how you go along with it. Are you going to be a Hindu historian or a Muslim historian or a Christian historian? This is the first decision you have to make. Are you an advocate for a religion or a nation or a race? Or are you a judge? And therefore, philosophical understanding, above all rationalism, is the basics of a historian. I'm very nervous when AMU has gone to Kirat at every meeting. It was not so when I was a student. An academic institution should, in its understanding, be free of religious ideologies. They have their own place in your personal life, but as far as an academic institution is concerned, an academic approach is concerned, you must place yourself in a position as a historian, as a sociologist, who has no particular affiliations and can, can judge impartially <coughs> and humanely. And I think that's the message that Ajaz Ahmed's writings always convey to one. The last essay perhaps that he wrote, because that was contributed to social scientists, I, I think it has not yet been published, was on secularism. And he strongly argued that secularism should not be um, qualified as it is being done today. Secularism means not equal treatment of all religions, but total dissociation from religion. 
I hope that article is published and circulated. Um, so when we come, come to history and the philosophical background of history, one has to decide how, do one, how does one proceed. And because of the audience here perhaps, it is very interesting how Muslims set about it. And I should like to argue that reason apple has been a very important element of Persianate culture in India. It is true that Orthodox Islam does not permit a large number of statements in prose, but it does permit them in poetry. And therefore, it is important to remember that in Indian history, both in ancient India and in medieval India, where Persian predominated as the official and perhaps the leading literary language of the country, there was important rational tradition. I shall begin reminding you of Ashoka. Ashoka is known from his inscriptions and from Buddhist traditions. But the Ashoka is inscription of inscription is totally different from the Ashoka of Buddhist tradition. In his inscriptions, when he talks of Dhamma, he means morality. He doesn't invite anyone to become a Buddhist. And that morality is totally irreligious, unreligious, I would say. It has no reference to any religion. Look after your parents, be merciful to the poor. These are the main elements. And there was an India at the time in which there was no word for religion. Dhamma means, or Dharma or Dhamma in Prakrit means morality. So when Ashoka issued his edict number 12, Rock Edict 12, which I think all communal people should read, particularly BJP people. Uh, he says that you should not, people of different religions should not quarrel among each other. They should try to understand each other. They should tolerate each other and so on. The interesting thing is the word he uses for religion. It is Pasanda which in Hindi is Pakhand, a fraud, a bad name in Sanskrit. So Brahmans called Buddhist Pakhands, Pashandas, and the Buddhists call them Pasanda in Prakrit, that is to say, frauds. So Ashoka uses the word fraud because this was what was being used by one religion for another. There was no word for religion in the Indian languages at that time. Which shows at least that at one time in our culture, we were free largely of this institution. And when this institution came about, there is no word for it. And therefore the word used is passant. In very interesting ways, Ashoka separates morality from religion. In his edict, rock edicts in Afghanistan, in the Pandha rock edict, one part is in Greek and one part is in Aramaic. In Aramaic, he says you should follow morality because then at the day of judgment, you will have no problem. He is now thinking of Parsi Zoroastrians because this idea of heaven and hell and judgment, day of judgment, all comes to Islam from Parsi religion, Zoroastrianism through Judaism and Christianity. So he says that you will be able to face the day of judgment. But when he addresses the Greeks, in the Greek part of the edict, 
he says just morality is good and you should follow it. He knows that Greeks don't believe in afterlife. They were good rationalists, reasonable people, and they did not believe that after death you have any existence. So Ashoka knew that, and therefore he doesn't profit, promise them either heaven or day of judgment because he knows they will laugh at it. So we had in India, at that time in India, a beliefs that are practically gone now from our civilization, our society. So history tells you something also about what types have been held and how when we pursue history, we should forget about our own beliefs and if we want to understand the show, for instance, we should have to study the philosophical background uh, which contributed to this very modern and rational uh, bulk of ideas that you find in Ashokan inscriptions. Uh, they are so often so rational that often writers and Ashoka who omit uh, this particular aspect and just treat him as a patron of Buddhism. Now when we come to Muslims, um, there is a very a view that they were orthodox and like our university they began everything substantial with Qirat and with reference to Quran. But in reality matters were sometimes different. First of all, what the Muslims could not say in prose, they said in poetry. And now, for instance, Amir Khosrow has a couplet. Harqam ras trahe dinu kab lagahe Man qibla ras kardam barsim de kaj kulahe Now, this means that you have all kinds of religions but as far as uh, I am concerned, the correct direction is in the towards the beloved, towards the worldly beloved. But Kulai means actually a woman. Uh, this was so dangerous a verse, but so popular that subsequently a false meaning was given to it, in which it was said that Kajpulahe means uh, Shaykh Nizam, Nizamuddin Aliyah. Totally wrong. In fact, Kajpulahe is used in Amir Khosrow's other verses, always in the sense of a female variable. Uh, so, clearly worldly life was glorified over religion in Persian world. You have Hafiz Shirazi who is run down by Akbar for that reason, but Hafiz is of course one of the great poets in Persian, read in every literate household in India, in the Mughal times, in which he uh, criticizes religious orthodoxy. In India himself produced Urfi, who says once that um, I looked at Kufr Hinduism or non-Islam, I looked at Islam, I looked at Islam mixed with Hinduism, he is here perhaps referring to Akbar's eclectic views, but they all failed me, they all failed me. Kufne Islam ne Islam e Kufra mez ne Hikmat e Eidad na janam Chis dari jadima I don't know why God created us for what purpose These religions don't tell us It was perhaps an answer to Shira Fafiz in which he had said that reason does not tell us why we came into existence 
He said, then, does religion tell us how we came into existence? Said Lord Shri. And there's another verse which is uh, quoted by Abul Fazl and is well known. Uh, so live or feel that when you die, a Muslim washes your body in holy water and a Hindu cremates it. So, and then <coughs> Abul Fazl, perhaps the greatest writer in Persian India produced, tells us that religion should never dominate polity. And he refers to the early history of Islam in which he said that the dominance of religion was very unjust. This is the first criticism I have ever heard of a Muslim, Muslim writer criticizing the Caliphate. And he says that a king should not attack reason to become unpopular, to become popular. All these find you think you find in Ayn And our founder too, who edited Ayn Akbari, believed that the word of God is subject to the work of God. Religion must submit to science. This is a message that our university has long forgotten and is normally suppressed. But as far as our founder was concerned, he announced it he published a monograph of it and the whole correspondence exists. So when I'm talking about reason and philosophy, rational philosophy, I'm talking about an old tradition, both existing in Raghdik in ancient India, as illustrated by Ashoka, and the whole project of Akal or rationalism in the so-called Islamic culture of India. And I therefore, we therefore are heirs to a very important rational tradition, which we ought not to forget, but should embrace and study. I then come to modern um, views of constructing history and what whole philosophy has in it or different schools of philosophy. There are, uh, it is obvious that history writing is often influenced by the interests of the classes or groups to which the historian belongs. If he's a Brahman, he might wish to exalt Brahman rulers, Brahman dynasties. If he's a Sunni Muslim, he might exalt Abbasid Caliphate. And if he's a Shia, the Fatimid Caliphate. These kinds of influences play their part in the history and in, in historical research and the transmission of history. There's a whole school of colonial historiography which exalted colonialism as a civilizing mission. And of course, they had a clear case. Europe was far advanced in science, in reason, in rational philosophy than the East or Latin America. So therefore, such cases are not unnatural. It is very natural for an advanced country, a wealthier country, to, and a country more advanced in science and learning, to exalt its own tradition in history, and to uh, ask such questions as why Orient did not have a renaissance 
why the Dorian did not have an Adam Smith, and so forth. These are, I don't say that these are not in, invalid questions, these are the valid questions. And in fact, um, any um, Eurocentric person is not necessarily wrong because he is Eurocentric. But clearly, there has to be a rational standard which has to be uh, followed by all historians. A basic rational philosophy of cause and effect which has to be followed. There was a statement by Confucius, the Chinese philosopher of over 2000 years ago, in which he said that when I go out for a walk with two persons, I always learn something. This is a very interesting and important statement, how much ordinary it might look to you. Because it has happened that areas with large populations have advanced more than areas with scattered populations, like Central and South Africa, or America, the New World before its discovery by Columbus, and even 100 years after the discovery of Columbus, because the Spaniards practically murdered the whole population. So, they are in America and parts of Africa, even the wheel was not discovered, iron was not discovered, and so forth. So, where human beings have been few, progress has been very limited. And this actually uh, brings out the wisdom of Confucius' statement, that where there are many, there would be advance. So, let us here then forget about race. Wherever there were more people, there were more inventions. China was a very populous country, and look at its inventions. They changed the world. Paper, printing, unfortunately gunpowder. They are all Chinese inventions. And many others. Deer uh, wheels, for instance, spinning wheel. So, um, clearly, populations have mattered. And therefore, racial theory or any philosophy of race should be totally thrown out. Now, here I would like to come to some contemporary situation problem. If you turn to India, then Indian history has been constructed by professional historians. Very ably, I would think, when I was an intermediate student at the railway stall, I, from pocket money, purchased R.G. Bhandarkar, the peep into the early history of India, lectures of 1920. And a remarkable piece showing how, from different kinds of evidence, you can construct the, reconstruct the history of ancient India. It was all rational. There was no bombastic word of praise. It was just a technical reconstruction of history. Now, however, there are different assumptions. There is first the assumption of race, totally outside the can of Haji Bhandar that Indians were the earliest Aryans. Is this a just? Uh, that be, uh, now this is the official doctrine. Uh, the UGC in its syllabus for BA courses, which I think should be printed and distributed in order to understand how illiterate the University Grants Commission today is. Because it begins by saying, that Aryans were the original inhabitants of India. <laughs> and they went and popul populated the world. <clears throat> now, the 
first problem is what is good in Aryan? Why should anyone be Aryan? Whatever the Aryan achievements, uh, if you mean by Aryan Indo-European, which is also dubious, uh, then Aristotle, say predecessor, Plato, Socrates, to go mostly, were Aryans, but they were not Indians, they were Greeks. So how being Aryan, you can just presume upon other people's inventions and learn. This is totally a Nazi doctrine. It was Nazis who took the word Arya. Arya and Arya are Indo-Iranic words. Iran means Aryans in plural, though few people know about it. This has nothing to do with Germans or Europeans, but Hitler adopted this Aryan race theory and he thought that he declared that Germans were the original Aryans. So perhaps UGC doesn't study history, otherwise they would know that what they are saying is exactly what Hitler had said in the 1930s. Uh, so it is this kind of illiteracy that rational philosophy must oppose. There is nothing intrinsic in race, nothing intrinsic in genes. As Confucius had propounded, the more people there are, the greater the achievement, the greater the invention, the greater the knowledge. In scattered communities, knowledge, knowledge grows more slowly. And therefore, there is nothing particularly relating to genes. And it's not known that there were Aryan genes at all. All that is under dispute. So, first of all, when we reconstruct history, we should have reason behind us. I shall continue to um, discuss the UGC syllabus. Uh, prescribed syllabus as one which rationalism should totally reject. You see, if you read any Dharmashastra uh, or including Arthashastra, Kautilya, Arthashastra, which we now uh, believe was written about 2nd century AD, some parts of it going to Mauryan times, but not the most of it, or Manusmriti written about the same time because it mentions Shakas and others who came to India only in post modern times. Anyway, that also is second century AD. Now these two works, like some earlier works also, are full of detailed prescriptions of castes. Punishments vary according to caste. Um, Castes are determined by the kind of profession you follow. Shudras cannot be, agriculture peasants cannot be Aryas or these three, or one of the three respectable classes, they must be Shudras because the plough injures insects. Uh, it's, a, it's a use of the Ahimsa doctrine of Buddhists for hostile purposes, for justifying the uh, placing of peasants in the Shudra caste. So you have this whole caste mechanism. Now, according to UGC syllabus, caste did not exist in ancient India because there is no mention of caste or the social organization. It was brought to India by Muslims. Now, Muslims probably increased enslavement in India because slavery was a very unfortunate aspect of Muslim societies and our uh, Persian histori historians writing in Persian show us how large numbers of peasants and peasant and ordinary women were enslaved. But they had no caste system. Master and slave difference is diabolical, but it is not the same as caste system. The um, often statements of modern Muslim historians like my teacher 
Professor Khalif Ahmad Nidami that Muslims brought equality in India is also not the uh, concept of equality is not justified by writings. No Muslim writer that I have seen has spoken of masabat as a necessary element of Sharia. No one. First, there is a difference between men and women. Women are insulted in those works. A woman's voice should not go out of the house and so forth. Common statement among Muslim writers. And then, of course, justification of slavery. It was, in fact, Akbar who prohibited enslavement and uh, removed the slave markets. Whatever the other faults of the Mughal Empire, there were no slave markets in the Mughal Empire as there were in the Delhi Sultan. So, um, a, an emperor who disregarded Islamic tenets, uh, like Akbar, who often spoke of Islam as Ahmadi Kesh Muhammad religion, Mohammedanism, mm -hmm. um, as if he didn't know he was outside of it. Uh, but in this particular matter, he stands particularly tall. Now, um, therefore, attributing modern ideas to earlier times and assuming that Muslim theologians should have stressed the importance of equality is not justified by any perusal of Muslim writings. I have not yet found any uh, statement by any Muslim theologian who would say that Masabat is an element of Islam. Never. There are of course reasonable uh, statements also. For instance, the punishment for adultery in Sharia is so unnatural that it is a woman who is to be punished always. That uh, a mystic like Nasiruddin Chara gave instances of Ali allowing no punishment for adultery to women on various reasons. And this meant, of course, that there was a moral feeling, which I would say a philosophical feeling, that women should not be injured and should not be punished. I confess that I have not come across a single case of punishment for adultery from Mughal times. There is no single case. In other words, gradually the words of Sharia were overlooked and humanity came into being. So, there are areas in which religious learning, Islamic theology were set on one side. I have given you two kinds of examples. One is the defiance of religion in poetry, and the other is defiance of religious law in actual practice. Now, Akbar actually abolished slave markets, and there was a complaint by an Iranian merchant that he lost an ear because he was found dealing in slave trade by the Kotwal of Agra, the capital of the empire at that time. So, the law was actually implemented. When we come to modern times, and this is with which I would end, um, one must recognize that when modern ideas came, not only political, coming from the French Revolution and 
British constitutional developments and also economic ideas when Indians read Adam Smith and few people know that Adam Smith had said that British rule in Bengal can only ruin Bengal. So, when modern philosophy and political philosophy developed, then even England voices were raised that England should not exploit India. It had been said that our Professor Raja Dharma, that he was a Marxist philosopher. In fact, Karl Marx, in his writings right from 1840s and certainly throughout 1850s, denounced British rule in India and as early as 1852 foresaw that India might free herself by its own efforts even earlier than the British victory of the British the European working classes in Europe. Uh, so, there is a worldwide philosophical theory, uh, area of philosophical theory, in which there are various differences, but essentially, at least, I find no justification for colonialism. Uh, and when Indian politicians, political leaders, nationalists quoted John Stuart Mill or quoted other English political philosophers in order to justify the Indian cause, what they were doing was to apply the principles of modern political philosophy also to India and to develop their the vision of a free India according to European democratic ideas. Now, what we are seeing today, that is why I think this, these kinds of discussions are very important is the official disavowal of modern philosophy, modern humanistic philosophy. First of all, as I've indicated by reference to the UGC syllabus, there is a total fabrication of history. You see, history is not something which you can just reconstruct. History can't be changed. What has happened can't be changed. You can only manufacture, you can only create myths. And therefore, the mythology is being now promoted. Um, this mythology is doubly vicious because not only is it untrue, but is it as anti humane It picks out uh, virtuous people as against the rest. Virtuous in its own arms. And I think that today History is a ground where rationalists have to fight against myth builders. Myth builders have a philosophy of their own. To them, um, the fitting of elephant set to Lugard Ganesha was really a bit of surgery. They believed that it was true. Our own Prime Minister, one of his earliest statements on the, on the support of science, he said that we, are, we know about 
plastic surgery because of Lord Ganesh. And the first session of the Indian History Congress after he came to power actually passed a resolution condemning this remark. So history is really uh, under attack. And what is being reconstructed is a very dangerous mythology <coughs> in which Brahmans and Rajputs are to be glorified. There is not a word in the UGC syllabus about the oppression which the Shudras and the outcasts suffered from in ancient and medieval society, also from Muslims. But there is not a word about that, as if they didn't exist in the Indian population. And this syllabus is remarkable with the fact that it omits any mention of Akbar, despite the fact that to many people throughout the world, among Indian rulers, Akbar is the only name well known, Ashok and Akbar. Ashok also gets just one mention, nothing about his inscriptions, nothing about the fact that he introduced writing in India. In northern India, nothing is found written before Akbar's inscription, Ashok's inscriptions. Even that is all overlooked. So, we are not being presented the history, the history syllabus, which is more like the Nazi syllabus for schools in Germany. If you just substitute India for Germany, you will get it. Um, I must say that, you know, Pakistan has not done any better. A country which has the earliest agricultural settlement one of the earliest agricultural settlements in Baluchistan, a country which has Mohanjadaro and Harappa as the great cities of Indus civilization, a country has that marvelous site of Taxila, all ancient sites, which had Mayana Buddhism and uh, its uh, Gandhara school of sculpture. That doesn't teach them to its schools. You know, Pakistan is an example of what can happen. History begins with Muhammad bin Qasim and with all the wrong things attributed to Muhammad bin Qasim which the poor fellow didn't do. He didn't destroy temples. He didn't. Um, in fact, Ajaj bin Yusuf, the governor general, had asked him not to. He said, treat them as other non-Muslims in our country, our territories. So, Muhammad bin Qasim is the hero and history begins from that. What we are now getting is a kind of Indian version of our history, shamanistic version, in which uh, Muslims are ruled out. You know, Tipu Sultan is now suddenly becoming an evil figure. The train after his name has been renamed. Uh, his name is being removed from everywhere. Uh, all people who died in the national struggle in Kerala, if they were Muslims, have been removed from the martyrs statement by the Indian Council of Historical Research. Um, because they might have been Moplas. And Mopla is a bad name because they, they were Muslims uh, in the uh, dictionary of Bharatiya Janata Party and RSS. So actually, for reason and philosophy, the protection of reason and philosophy, of reason and history, now is the time. And I am very happy that a step has been taken to bring members of the university together, not only of, I hope, not only of the faculty of uh, humanities, but also of um, all uh, departments of the university 
in order to promote the cause of reason and rational philosophy. Thank you. Sir, thank you so much for uh, walking us through a va vast expanse of time, history, emphasizing the importance of reason in the pursuit of scholarship. Hello. So, I would like to request now uh, Professor Professor Habib's uh, <coughs> lecture. <coughs>